Honoring the Rose was a spiritual revelation which directed a renewed investigation into the real truth of how our 35th President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, was assassinated. As numerous roses surrounded the President and his wife, those same roses became the answer to the most infamous murder of the 20th century. On November 22, 1963, John Fitzgerald Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. And many, many miles away from that location, a seven-year-old Catholic boy was given a message. And that seven-year-old boy was me. And this is my story. Friday, November 22nd, 1963, will it be a day that will live in my memory forever. I remember coming home from Catholic school and running into the basement and turning on the TV with my brothers. I remember being glued to the visions on that black and white television set. I also recall distinctly having to go upstairs for something. And when I went upstairs, I was in this long hallway which led to the bedrooms upstairs and when I was on my way to the bedroom I distinctly heard a voice say the people that he was with did it what did that mean the people that he was with did it I looked around and I didn't see anybody Yet I distinctly heard a voice, a soft man's voice. And the only thing that was in the hallway was me and a crucifix. I'm sitting there going, what the heck was that? Everyone in Texas, Fort Worth is so thin, having uh, gotten up and down about uh, nine times. This is, this is what you do every morning. Two years ago, I said that uh, introduced myself in Paris by saying that I was the man who had accompanied uh, Mrs. Kennedy to Paris, 
I'm getting that somewhat that same sensation uh, as I travel around uh, Texas. <laughs> Nobody wonders what Lyndon and I wear. <laughs> thousands of people out to greet the president. at this time has given roses for her appreciation. Governor Connolly is trying to rush things at this time to keep things moving. The president here is so happy to be in Dallas. president is going to get into the limo. Standing there is Governor Conley. As they are ready, the president will begin his last motorcade.
The following film is very important. It is the last film and final movements of one of our greatest presidents, John F. Kennedy. We will show you that it has been tampered with and certain images have been superimposed to hide the truth. Also, you must ask yourself why we didn't see this film for so long and why couldn't we be privy to the information that is locked up for 75 years under the Warren Report. With Oswald's assassination, America saw this film immediately afterwards. On President Ford's attempted assassination, we saw this film immediately too. On President Reagan's attempted assassination, we saw this immediately. Then why didn't we see President Kennedy's immediately? There was a reason, and we will show you at this time our explanation of who really shot and killed our President John F. Kennedy. Ladies and gentlemen, you are the jury, and you are going to witness the truth of who and how our President John F. Kennedy was killed. President and Jackie are seated. Please note that there is a one-piece seat. In front of the President is Governor Conley and to his left is Mrs. Conley. They are sitting on jump seats which are separate seats with an opening between them. This opening goes from the partition in front of them all the way back to the President's seat. The Secret Service people are also on a one-piece seat. These arrangements become very important, as in the following we will show. Now we will show you the film at different speeds, mostly at slower speeds, or we are going to stop the film entirely to explain what happened in that frame. As the president's limo rounds the corner before the Stemmons sign, watch right here. They have inserted a smudge mark across the limo. This smudge that crosses the limo is planted there to hide the first shot that missed. What about that shot? Well, what is what happened behind that smudge mark? Who shot what or who? The president at this time is reacting to a noise. He looks to his left and then turns to his right. At this moment, Governor Conley too is moving to his right and then to his left. Why is everybody starting to move suddenly? The reason was that there was a gunshot fired. But this first shot missed our president. But what really happened? Who shot that first shot? No, it wasn't Oswald. Behind the smudge, it shows the killer moving his gun across his chest area. That's why the smudge appears. Again, ladies and gentlemen, you have never heard of these allegations before. The person that killed our 35th president, John F. Kennedy, was the host of the Dallas visit. Yes, Governor John Conway. This may be very hard for you to believe, but this is how it really happened. Please watch further as we will show you the most conclusive evidence of this most infamous assassination. As the motorcade approaches the stem and sign, again there is something that happens behind the sign. Why? Again look at these smudge marks in the film. What we believe that has happened is that Governor Connolly took his second shot at the president and this one did hit our president in the neck. As the president clutches his neck, Governor Connolly, if you remember, has supposedly been wounded by Oswald by the so-called magic bullet. The so-called magic bullet was supposedly have gone through the governor's shoulder, then passing through his wrist. In the following frames, we contend he was never shot 
and a man that is wounded does not move around more after he was shot than he did before. Do you see our president moving? No, because he is really shot and Conley is not. Jackie, too, is reacting to her husband, but look very close to her eyes. They are focused on Governor Conley. Why? She is pleading with the governor, with her eyes, not to shoot him again. But as you can now see, what we contend, what is in Conley's left hand is the murder weapon, a hand gun. Holds the gun in his left hand, and in his right hand, he has his hat trying to hide it from the public. But when he turns and looks at the president, he finds out that he has to switch the gun to his right hand so that he can get closer to the president. But please notice, as the governor turns and points the gun at the president, a black line is coming up from the bottom of your screen. Yes, that black line was to cover everything up that you just saw. As you can see, the goes higher and higher to cover what you are not supposed to see. Suddenly the line starts to move down just before the final headshot. The frames just before and after the final headshot are the most important frames of the entire Zabruder film. Please watch. These frames have been overlooked by all of the experts until now. Very cleverly, images have been superimposed. The image of Governor's head has been changed so he is looking away from the President. In reality, underneath that superimposed head, the Governor is looking directly at the President. Also his right arm that you see is also an image of deception. They have doctored the film to make it look like the governor's right hand is holding his hand with his left hand in front of him. But in reality, the governor's right arm with the gun in hand is moving closer to the president. Remember, in those seating arrangements earlier, at this time they become very important. As the governor is turned around, he is falling backwards toward his wife with the gun in his right hand, puts his arm between the jump seats, and moves his arm with the gun in hand towards the president. With help of the black line, which hides the movement that we just mentioned, for some reason that line starts to go down, which shows then the governor's final lunge of his arm towards the president. You are now going to witness the newly discovered evidence. And yes, we have a truly smoking gun, which you will witness. This next sequence for some may be horrifying, but it must be shown. Now watch when the president is shot in the head. There. Now watch to Jackie's left of her left shoulder. You now are witnessing the smoking gun, the flash from Conley's gun. Yes, that was the smoking gun that killed our president. At this time, look very closely to the right of the flash. You can see flesh tones of a human hand. The ones that doctored this film, though have tried to make this hand look like part of the car's inside door trim panel. But this piece of door panel moves. Yes, it is the governor's hand. If you missed it, we will run this sequence again, but at a little faster speed.
there. Did you see the flash? For those of you that don't understand ballistics, the bullet travels first, which is the fastest, then followed by the flash from the barrel of the gun. As the damage to our great president has now been done, Jackie now begins to retrieve pieces of her beloved husband. But please watch, there is one more sickening scene. As the limo begins to speed away, look at the back of the two jump seats right now. Do you see something? Yes, Governor Conway is looking between the seats at the president to see if he accomplished his objectives. And he did. What better way to hide the truth from the American people but to have one of your victims as the assassin. God have mercy on all that were involved in this conspiracy. Welcome to part two of Honor the Rose. With part two of the film, we will go over freeze frames of the Zapruder film. We will also show other pictures and film to show more evidence to prove our case. And at the end, we will show who we think were part of this alleged conspiracy. In a dream, I was told to honor the rose. The answer to this mystery has always been in the roses. Jackie Kennedy said as much in an interview she did days after the assassination with Theodore H. White, an old Kennedy family friend. That interview, which was locked up for many years and was released one year after her death in 1994, was very telling. There was a deep anger about what was done to her and her husband. In part of that interview, she said that she thought it odd that with three stops in Texas, she received yellow roses, but in Dallas, she was given red roses.
Now let's do a recap from part one of Honor the Rose. We will quickly go over the flash so that you're an expert with the flash. This will only take a few seconds. And the first shot you'll see is a close-up. There it is, the close-up. And we'll pan out a little bit. So you can see the inside of the car. You can see the flash there. And it'll be coming up one more time here. And then last but not least, one more time. There we go. Okay, now we'll move on from there to this next picture. It'll be a still frame. And that is right before the first shot. The first smudge mark or the missing frames. Right there is a gun. Okay, now we're looking at a still frame of Governor Conley and his two heads. And he's leaning back, aiming at the president. Right here at the stem and sign, or right before the stem and sign, you can see the governor and his two heads. There's the back of his gray hair, and he's turning around at the president. This frame is just beyond the stem and sign. You can see on the top of his shoulder is a barrel of a gun. Here's doctored footage of the gun. Here's footage of the superimposed head. Look how wide the governor's head is in this frame. Alrighty, here's uh, another shot of the superimposed head. In the background around the red area is his original head. That is the governor's real head where the red is. Alrighty, now we're back to showing you the footage at the airport where the motorcade begins. Something very interesting happens here. Let's see if you can see a gun. This is undoctored footage of a gun. We'll let you see if you can see it. Did you see that? The Kennedys turn around, and that's when the governor takes out his gun and puts it in his lap. Right there. We'll zoom in on it. There's a couple frames right there. Okay, we'll run it one more time. There you go. So, if you didn't believe us before, maybe you'll believe us now. Okay, now, we're going to see the rare Zapruder film. This is the Secret Service copy. Here it comes. So, what makes this film so rare and special? Well, it shows doctored footage of the governor bringing his gun across his chest. Yes, believe it or not, it does. And how does it do it? Well, this film is not missing any frames, like the Zapruder films of today. So we will focus in on that area. And that area should be coming up here pretty soon. Also notice, uh, this is a panned out version here. Okay, and then uh, the next run of the film will show the circle. See that? See the quick jerky motion there and the gun coming across the chest? Just a very split second. Here's the panned out version again. So you're, you're seeing a panned out version and a closer version.
There. Did you see it? Just a split second. Coming up next, still frames of the gun coming across the governor's chest. As soon as the orange arrow disappears and then comes back, that's when the gun comes across. Watch it now. Right there. there that thing that looks like a J, that's the doctored footage of a gun. Okay, so there's the gun, and we will fade out of this and then zoom back into it. Right there's the J, and we're going to go back a frame, go backwards, and that's right there. There you see the hand, and then we'll go forward again. Right there. See the J? That's the gun coming across the governor's chest. Here we see the superimposed head of the governor. See it there? It's very clear that there's an image laid on the left side of the head and on the right side of the head is the original head or the governor's real head. It's very obvious. In frames 223 and 224, you will notice there's something moving on the governor's lapel. This is doctored footage of the gun as we go back and forth, back and forth. Up next, the governor at Parkland Hospital in an interview laying in his bed with his, with his wife. It's a very interesting interview. The conspirators had to show the world that the governor was indeed injured. So, in the interview, you'll notice that the governor will raise his left hand to his shoulder and as to catch himself, say, oh, I was injured so badly. Also, you will notice that he snaps his fingers in explaining how he was hurt. Listen to it. You can't see it, but you can hear it. So watch this interview and see if this guy really looks like he's injured. As soon as he was able, Governor Connolly appeared on nationwide television to give the most lucid account so far of the tragic events. He had just turned the corner. We heard a shot. I turned to look in the back seat. The president had slumped. He had said nothing. Almost simultaneously, as I turned, I was hit. And I knew I'd been hit bad. Here are three of our greatest presidents. Our first president, George Washington. Our 16th, Abe Lincoln. And our 35th, John Kennedy. Each of them earned the presidency, but there was a man from Texas who shot his way to the presidency. He wanted that presidential seal on his jacket, on the outside of his plane, 
and on the inside too. He wanted to speak behind it, and he wanted to have it in his car. But most of all, he wanted the power. It's something he always wanted. LBJ could not do this murder by himself. So he, along with his old buddy and campaign manager, the can-do man, John B. Conley Jr., hatched a plan. That plan would have this son of a poor tenant farmer, lawyer, lobbyist for the rich Texas oil men, and former Secretary of the Navy, shoot and kill our president. The plan for the Texas trip started at the Cortez Hotel in El Paso, Texas on June 5, 1963, where JFK, John Conley, and LBJ met to go over the details of the so-called campaign visit. Of those three, one was the assassin, Conley, one was the victim, JFK, and one was the benefactor, LBJ. It's been reported that LBJ and his henchman, Mac Wallace, allegedly could be responsible for as many as seven deaths, including LBJ's own sister, who had loose lips and was a liability for him and his career. That bit of reporting from the last segment of The Men Who Shot Kennedy, The Guilty Men, which aired very briefly and was barred from airing again by the LBJ family? Or was it our own government because it hit too close to the truth? This man could easily order a murder, and with a blink of an eye, it was all over for JFK. In early October 1963, Conley or Big Bad John, as some have referred to him as, took over the details of the motorcade route and made sure it took an unnecessary right turn on Houston, off of Main Street, and on to Elm Street, where the Texas School Book Depository was located. This is where Lee Harvey Oswald was that day, on November 22, 1963. Lee Harvey Oswald would become the perfect communist sympathizer Patsy, blamed for everything, then shot and murdered so as not to have any trial and close down the speculation of any conspiracy. The investigation, which was a presidential murder cover-up, was called the Warren Commission. Some of the members selected by LBJ were very suspicious, like Alan Dulles, the former head of the CIA, until he was fired by JFK. John McCloy, lawyer for the rich oil family, the Rockefellers, and Chase Manhattan Bank, and former head of the World Bank. These two were directing that investigation to make sure it went the way the CIA, FBI, and big oil men wanted it to go. Where was the FBI during all this? J. Edgar Hoover hated the Kennedy brothers and loved LBJ. They were close buds, being neighbors for over 20 years. It's been reported that on the night before the assassination, J. Edgar himself was at the Texas home of oilman Clint Murchison, one of Texas' richest oilmen. Also at that meeting, Warren Commission member John McCloy, former vice president at the time Richard Nixon, H.L. Hunt, and other oilmen. And with a late arrival of LBJ himself. It's interesting to note that on the day of the assassination, a Kennedy hater and oilman, H.L. Hunt, and arguably the richest man in America, flew his entire family down to Mexico with the advice that he should do so from his chief of security and bodyguard, a former FBI man. 
How does Jack Ruby, the mob, David Ferry, and Guy Bannister get involved in all this? Well, it was oil man Clint Merchantson who knew mobster Carlos Marcello, the godfather of New Orleans. Merkison was linked to the Mafia. In 1955, a Senate committee found that 20% of Merkison oil leasing was owned by Vito Genovese, a mobster. J. Edgar Hoover and FBI man Clyde Tolson also invested heavily in Merkison oil business. He, Merkison, also had financial ties to the godfather of New Orleans, Carlo Marcello. Marcello had vast holdings, legal and illegal. It's been said that Merkison owned a piece of Hoover. The rich were always putting their money with the crooked sheriff for protection. Lee Harvey Oswald was directed by at least two handlers of Carlos Marcello. David Ferry was Marcello's right-hand man and personal airplane pilot. And by former FBI man Guy Bannister. Guy Bannister worked for the defense team of Marcello on his second deportation hearing as an investigator. That hearing commenced on November 22nd, 1963. Jack Ruby was a mobster, plain and simple, and was seen with Oswald before the assassination at his carousel nightclub. We could go on and on and on, but to keep this under one hour, we must close now. We will leave you in closing with six main points, and they are. Number one. After the assassination, OBJ's mistress, Madeline Brown, said that OBJ told her Texas oil men he knew and the CIA were responsible for killing the president. Point number two, the governor and assassin was wheeled to a private room for his surgery under heavy guard. He faked his wounds, planted the so-called magic bullet on his own stretcher, and then had someone launder his clothing to get rid of the gunpowder residue. And they called it a mistake. How convenient. Then LBJ ordered within three days of the murder that the limo inside interior should be ripped out and refurbished by the Ford Motor Company. Another destruction of evidence. The crime scene. Number four. The autopsy was a complete joke. It was controlled by generals and was given by military men that had no experience in gunshot wounds whatsoever. Point number five, the Z film has been doctored, no question about it. The next film and others are missing frames. Those films all in the hands of the FBI and the CIA immediately after the assassination. Years later, Kodak Company in the late 1990s offered to digitize the Z film for free, but the government refused. Oh, I wonder why. Number six, lastly, it's our country. A country for the people, by the people, not just the rich, crooked, and powerful. Let's take this information and start a new investigation. We, the people, can do it. The government has nothing to gain and everything to lose to get to the bottom of this crime. Thanks for watching. Yours truly.